So today we're going to talk about two degrees of freedom, not just one, but two. So with two degrees of freedom, that means the particle is free to move in two dimensions. And this is covered in chapters two and three of Kasdan and Paley. So to introduce this, we'll talk about uh, free fall motion in uniform gravity. So the idea would be, here's like the surface of the moon. Okay, because there's no, there's no air, it's just vacuum. So if we have some kind of rocket, starts with some initial velocity, you know, it's, it's already got its rocket fuel spent and it starts out at some height above the ground. Here's the gravitational acceleration uh, constant. And what's the motion gonna be? So it starts out at some initial position and we all sort of hopefully intuitively expect it's gonna follow a parabola and hit the ground. So th this is free fall motion in uniform gravity with no air resistance. And I think this is the same as tutorial 2.6. Got the book right here. Yeah, calls it the tossed point mass, but just means uniform gravity and no air resistance. And let's say we want to know something like, uh, you know, after after a certain amount of time, what's the distance traveled? This is really hard to read. Let me put it up here. D, what's the distance traveled? Okay. So the first thing would be we set up an inertial frame so that we could write down the vector of the position. So let's go, let's go through that. So we set up a, a frame. That's the same as a coordinate system. So we pick some origin. Maybe this origin is on the ground if you want. And we've got some unit vectors. I'll call it the one along the ground, N1, the one that's vertical, N2. We'll put little hats on them so we know these are unit vectors put the I, so it reminds us this is an inertial frame. And then here is our, our mass, M. <clears throat> we're treating this, say rocket or whatever it is, it's just a point mass. So we're not worried about rotational dynamics. It's just, where is the thing? Translational dynamics. So we, we write that this is a point P, and then the vector from R to P, R, P with respect to O using the notation from last time. And just to make life a little bit easier, we'll just write R. We'll drop the P, O. We'll just, it's understood. This is where the point is. Um, let me also write that we've defined our inertial frame. It's got an origin O and we've got N1 and N2. So that's our inertial frame. And right now the, the origin is arbitrary, okay? Um, if you want, like I said, the origin is on the ground. Okay, so we're gonna write this vector as, um, we'll use the usual Cartesian components. So we'll say the, you know, the, the distance horizontally so from the origin and along the N1 direction, that's X. And the distance vertically, we'll call that Y. Okay, so then if we were to write, what does this vector from the origin to point P, it is X, a scalar quantity in the N1 vector direction, plus Y, a scalar quantity 
in the N2 vector direction. Another way that we could write this is as a column vector. So put X, Y, and then just to remind us what frame we're in, we'll put um, subscript I. And X and Y will vary with time. That's kind of the whole point. They vary with time uh, because that's the changing position of the mass. Now, before we even get to forces and things, we want to be able to write down the inertial vol velocity and then the inertial acceleration in terms of X and Y. So we will write R vector with an over dot, and this is just shorthand for the inertial derivative with respect to time of R. And I guess we could say RPO if we want. And what will this be? Well, it'll be dx dt n1 plus dy dt n2. There's, and there are other terms here. If you think of like x times n1, this is a product of two things. One's a scalar, one's a vector. But by the product rule, just like we took the derivative of the first part, x, we need to take the derivative of the second part, n1. So there's an implied x times the inertial derivative of n1 with respect to time and the inertial frame. But n1, is fixed in the inertial frame. It's not changing. So this is zero. There's also y times the derivative, inertial derivative of n2. But again, right, looking over here on, on the left, n1 and n2, they don't move with respect to the inertial frame because they, they're the vectors that define the inertial frame. So both of these are, are zero. We're just including that because it's gonna come up later when we deal with the vectors, unit vectors to describe a frame that will be moving, moving with respect to an inertial frame. And we could also use the shorthand notation we've used before for dx dt, which would just be x dot, and then this is y dot. Okay. So this is, x dot n1 plus y dot n2. Now we'll take the another derivative so we get the inertial acceleration since that's what goes into Newton's second law. So r double dot r vector double dot equals the inertial derivative of the inertial derivative r P O. So this will be, you know, following the same pattern, we'll get x double dot. So that's the second derivative of x in the n1 direction plus second derivative of y in the n2 direction. And then you can take all the derivatives you want of n1 and n2. It's not going to change anything because they're zero. All right. So this is, this is our acceleration. <clears throat> so this can be used as the acceleration in you know, F equals MA, or writing it out in a kind of careful way. It's what we'd say the mass of the particle, R double dot, the acceleration equals the total force on the particle. And we are considering something that's, um, the only force present is gravity. So here is, let me draw on this diagram over here, this orange vector, and this is mg, mass times the gravitational acceleration. It's pointing down. So if we were to write out, what is that? The total force on the particle is mg, that's the scalar, but what direction is it pointing? It's pointing in the negative n2 direction. 
just downward. Okay, or we could just say negative MGN2. All right, so far, so good. Let's, let's follow this train of thought. Okay, so let's write um, Newton's law, but now with every, all the different parts, we've got the acceleration and then we've got the force written over here. So this becomes M times X double dot N1 plus Y double dot N2 equals negative M G N2. Um, so it's implied that there's, there's no force in the N1 direction. So I could just add a zero times N1. So you could write things this way in this sort of vector format, or you could write it in matrix form. Sometimes it's easier to understand things when you write them in matrix form. So I'll do matrix form. All right, this means M X double dot, M Y double dot, for the left-hand side. And to remind ourselves, this is with respect to the inertial frame. The components are inertial frame components. And what do we have on the right-hand side? We've got, um, well, there's zero in the N1 direction and then minus MG in the N2 direction. So we've got that. And this is, this is a matrix or vector equation that we could just equate components and then we get two scalar components. So we'd have M X double dot equals zero, which just divide by M, get X double dot equals zero. And then for the N2 direction, we get Y double dot equals negative G. So this, these are two second order ODEs. And in fact, they're uncoupled. What does that mean? That means the X double dot equation on the right hand side, there's no mention of Y. And on the Y double dot equation on the right hand side, there's no mention of X. So the motion in the two directions is uncoupled. So this is a very nice situation. And in fact, uh, last time, uh, it, so because they're un uncoupled, we could think of these as two uncoupled one dimensional equations, which we've already solved. The first one is it's motion in the X direction with no force. And then the other one is motion in the Y direction but with a constant force. And we solved for both last time. So let's, um, let's suppose we'll solve these. Let's suppose we have some initial conditions. Let me write a little diagram of my particle. And I'll say here it is at t equals zero. That's as that's should be a zero. T equals zero. Here's my point P. Um, this thing starts out with a horizontal velocity, let's say, and here's the ground. So starts out with a given initial height and we expect the path this thing is going to take, it's going to just kind of go downward and to the right. So this will be like during T greater than zero and it'll hit the ground at some point. Here is It'll travel a distance D. Um, we'll choose our, our origin to be here, right below where this thing is released. And then we've got the N1 direction horizontally and two vertically. So what are our in initial conditions? We with this choice of where the origin is, X at time zero is zero. Y at time zero is H, the initial height. 
the initial velocity in the x direction is v naught, and the initial velocity in the y direction, we'll just assume that's zero. So this thing is being starting out horizontally, what's gonna happen? Well, like I said, we've solved for this already. So if you want using the solutions from last time, and this is a special case, like in general, it's not gonna be this easy. All right, so X is a function of time uh, is just V zero times T, V naught times T. Y is a function of time is H minus one half GT squared. So this describes the part where it's creating a parabola. This is like a parametric curve that describes a parabola. And suppose we want to know the time when this, um, when the particle hits the ground. We'll call that T. T is the time when the particle hits the ground. What does hitting the ground mean? That means that Y of capital T equals zero. So just, you put that in this equation for Y and then solve for T, capital T. So Y of capital T equals zero gives us uh, zero equals H minus one half G capital T squared. We get that the time is the square root of two times the height over the gravitational acceleration. Okay. We also wanna know how far did it travel, right? What's little d, how far did it travel uh, horizontally? So D is equal to X after a time capital T. So that's just the initial velocity times square root TH over square root TH over G. Yay. Here we go. Any questions about that? With air resistance, it gets more complicated. And that's, uh, that's not what we're gonna do next, but you can look at the tutorial 2.5 of the book. What I want to do next is uh, kind of another standard dynamics problem. This is the pendulum. So you've all seen a pendulum, right? Yes. This is a forced pendulum because I'm moving my finger, but right, if I release this from rest, it'll move. Okay. And what's different about this? So the first one had the motion in the X and Y directions was uncoupled. Now the motion is coupled. Right, so this is the simple planar pendulum. We've gotten into chapter three, so this is example 3.1. So if, if we were to uh, sketch the situation, we've got a ceiling Gravity's going down. There's a pivot point and a, a rod attached to a mass M. And 
Um, this is a, we call this a revolute joint, meaning it, it's like a, it's a hinge. It only allows motion um, as a hinge would. So that's the pivot point. And if we want to write F equals MA for this, well, we first need to pick an inertial frame, which includes finding an origin, and then write um, position of the particle with respect to that origin. So it sort of makes sense to choose like what's the natural point to use as a, the origin. Well, the pivot point makes sense. So we'll use, um, use the pivot point as the origin for our inertial frame. And if we use the same uh, orientation for our inertial frame as the previous example, that would mean, so we've got, so we're at an O for the pivot point and then N1 is horizontal and N2 is vertical. So our inertial frame is O, N1, N2. All right, where's our particle? Our particle is where the mass is. So that's our point P and we will write the vector R, call that R, P, zero. It's the location of the point P with respect to O. All right, so R, which is just R, P with respect to O. Just following everything from last time, this is X, N1 plus Y, N2. The inertial velocity is x dot n1 plus y dot n2. The inertial acceleration, x double dot n1 plus y double dot n2. Great. Okay. Uh, what forces are acting on this point P? Let me uh, scoot the label P out of the way here. P. We've got, should I use orange? I'll use orange. So there's gravity acting on the mass. There's also, this is a, a rod. And for now, let's just assume that it's has insignificant mass, so it's massless. There's tension in the rod. So we'll write that as a T vector. So the total force on the particle is going to be T uh, minus mg N2. And uh, using polar coordinates, this is not going, I mean, sorry, using, uh, using Cartesian coordinates, which is what we've got here. X and Y are Cartesian coordinates. Right, they're just the usual perpendicular coordinates. If you were to start writing out F equals MA with these Cartesian coordinates, you'll get something that looks just absolutely awful. X double dot equals negative YG sine arc tangent negative Y. Uh, it just goes on and on and it's ugly. It's, it's horrendous. So we'll put a sad face. Say we don't we don't want to use that approach because we get some. It's kind of aesthetic. We get some terrible looking ODEs. Differential equations in X and Y. That are hard to solve. And why is that? Well, you know, Cartesian coordinates aren't the uh, the best choice for this example. What you'd want to do is use polar coordinates. So 
So if we used polar coordinates, and what would that be? Um, like we write the angle theta and then sort of the, the length r. So the polar coordinates, r and theta, the ODEs will look nicer. And not just, you know, nicer, it's not just an aesthetic thing, it makes it easier to solve for. So we're going to now, before revisiting this problem, we're gonna talk about the polar frame and polar coordinates, and then we'll revisit this problem. Because there's some tricks uh, as to how to get the inertial, ex inertial velocity and the inertial acceleration when you have a polar frame and polar coordinates. Okay, so let's do that. Any questions? No. All right. So yeah. how would we know which coordinates to choose? Is it like anything that involves a rotation or something is always polar? Yeah, kind of, okay. yeah. Um, some of it is just experience, uh, but the, in, in this case, since you know, oh, okay, my mass is only, it's mostly doing rotation and what captures that best? Oh, polar coordinates, because then I have that theta, I have a, an, an angle. Um, sometimes it's trial and error, okay. but yeah. So let's talk about the polar frame and polar coordinates. And this is it's going to be like a general discussion, and it's a big uh, part of sec of well, chapter three of the book. So I'm looking at section three point four to three point five. If you want to read about this afterwards, and um, how will we do this? We'll write here's the particle p, and we have some origin o. The, the inertial frame will be something like that. Here's the uh, inertial frame. We might just call it the I frame. And it is O, N1, N2. A polar frame, the polar coordinate frame will have a unit vector that I'll write as ER hat, and it's pointing towards the particle. And then perpendicular to that is E theta. So this is the polar frame. And uh, I think the book calls it B for reasons that will not be clear yet. But when we talk about um, rigid bodies later, this is the frame attached to the body. So we call it the B frame. Right now there's no body that this is attached to necessarily. It's just sort of pointing towards the particle. It's got the same origin, but we've got uh, different unit vectors. So E R and E theta. So E R, like we said, is pointing in the direction of the particle. This is R P O. And the two polar coordinates would be R and uh, theta. So R is the P 
you haven't seen a polar coordinate frame, it's a distance from O to P. And theta is the angle that uh, the ER direction makes with N1. And so this is to be contrasted with the usual Cartesian coordinates, which should be X and Y. Okay. So that's our setup. And we want to, to be able to do calculations, we need the relationship between the polar frame and the inertial frame which means we need a relationship between the polar frame unit vectors and the inertial frame unit vectors. Maybe that's even worth writing down. And inertial frame unit vectors. So the way this might be different than the way you've handled things before is before you probably wrote down how is X related to R and theta and then how is Y related to R and theta and kind of work from there. You don't have to work from there. You can work at the level of unit vectors. So what will I do here? I'll, whoa, sorry about that. ER, the unit vector, you could always write this um, in terms of how it projects onto the N1 and N2 directions. So what does that mean? I'm writing, if I write ER, I could write it as the sum from one to two, I goes from one to two, ER dotted with, so this is the usual dot product, NI. We call it dot product, but this is also the projection of ER onto N1. Um, looking at this diagram up here, what does that mean? So ER projected onto N1 will be some amount. And then ER projected onto N2 will be some other amount. So we take those projections. Hopefully you've seen this in a, a course on vectors. So let's just write out this sum as there's ER dotted with N1 in the N1 direction plus ER dotted with N2 in the N2 direction. ER dotted with N1, so this projection right here, this is cosine of theta. And one way to think about that is, okay, if theta was actually zero, cosine, should have some um, maybe intuition about cosine. Cosine of zero is one. At least that's how I try to remember. I try to think of what's what would happen if the angles were small. Okay, so this is cosine theta and ER dotted with N2 is sine theta. So we've got that ER is cosine theta times the n1 direction plus sine theta in the n2 direction. And, and then similarly, if we do the same exercise for e theta over here, e theta and take its projection or dot product with n1 and n2, we'll get negative sine theta n1 plus cosine theta n2. And now the, the book, uh, well, I don't know if the book does this. I would recommend making a table that relates the unit vectors. Um, so I'll do that here. Make tables relating the unit vectors. And I think this is uh, page 68. Like we are really cooking along here. Yeah, it's like, a, it calls it a vector transformation table. 
And what does this look like? So we've got ER and E theta. Over here is the columns. And then N1, N2, and in each of these boxes, we are writing the dot product. So ER dotted with N1. Over here is ER dotted with N2. We've got E theta dotted with N1, E theta dotted with N2. And we'll just write out what that what that is. I'll kind of rewrite the table, but in each of the entries now I'll put you know sine or cosine. This is cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta. Uh, maybe the more familiar way, although it is somewhat of an abusive notation, is to write these, instead of write it as a table, you write it as a matrix, a relationship between the unit vectors. So we'll have ER, E theta, and the order is important, right? Um, so you gotta remember the order. We're gonna write ER E theta equals some two by two matrix. It's some two by two matrix multiplying N1 and N2. And what is this two by two matrix? Uh, it is cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta, and you're like, oh, that, that just looks like a rotation matrix. Yep, it is a rotation matrix. Oops. And the notation that I'll use, I think, that, yeah, the book uses it too, good, um, is for some reason it uses this matrix C. So C stands for rotation matrix. And there'll be a superscript in the front, I, and a superscript back here, B, because this is the rotation matrix that relates, if you want, it relates the I unit vectors with the B unit vectors, okay? If you wanted the other relationship, how do I write N1 and N2 in terms of ER and E theta? Well, because this is a rotation matrix, its inverse is just the transpose. So N1, N2 equals cosine theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta, ER, oops, E theta. So this matrix would be because it's it's over here and the B frame unit vectors are over there to the right and the I frame unit vectors are over there to the left. We write it that way. And this matrix is just uh, C I to B transpose matrix transpose. That's what this little superscript T means, okay? <clears throat> so this will, uh, this is handy because it, it relates the unit vectors. Um, but what do we want to do? We are trying to want now to uh, write the inertial derivative.
this thing. The inertial derivative of the location of the particle. But write it using, write it in polar coordinate frame. And so this can be confusing. We're taking the derivative with respect to one frame, but we can write it in terms of a different frame. So the usual way that you've probably seen to do this would be you write x equals r cosine. You, you, you relate the Cartesian coordinates and the polar coordinates and then you would say well I've got r my r vector equals x n1 plus y n2 I know that's true so now I'll just substitute in for x I'll put r cosine theta plus r sine theta n2 and then you would do something like take the inertial derivative of that. And so then this would be, once you've got scalars, you don't need to have the superscript to remind you that this is a derivative with respect to a, a frame. So this would be r, derivative of r cosine theta times n1. And then remember there's this sort of implied inertial derivative of the of the unit vector itself but of course this is zero and then same for the other part right derivative of r sine theta n2 that's the usual way that you would do it i don't think it's the best way and so homework problem one kind of guides you through this the better way is to use how simple it is to write the location of the particle using the polar coordinate frame. So rather than write it this way, in terms of the Cartesian way, you say, well, R P O equals R in the E R direction. And just to remind ourselves, I'll just uh, reproduce that diagram from before. We have the, this is our origin. Here's N1, here is N2, that's our, inertial frame, uh, polar coordinate frame. We've got ER pointing from O to P, and then perpendicular to that is E theta. The way I try to remember these is that uh, ER is the direction in which the R scalar increases. E theta is the direction in which the theta scalar increases. So this is theta, and from here to here, this distance is r. Let's write our vector r p with respect to o. Okay, we've got that. Um, and this is a particularly compact and nice way to to write things. So, and uh, just if you're ever gonna look back and try to follow along where we are. This is equation 3.25. We will now take the inertial derivative of R, P, O. Right, it's the inertial derivative of R, E, R. You're like, okay, what am I gonna do here? All right, so this is it's a scalar times a vector, and it's a product, so we use the usual product rule of derivatives. So this will be the derivative with respect to time of r times e r plus r derivative with respect to time in the inertial frame of e r. Okay, you might go, okay, d by dt of r, I'm just gonna write that uh, in shorthand form, it's r dot, scalar r dot. So it is how the scalar r is changing with time, times e r, but then still have this kind of mystery term over here. 
what is the inertial derivative with respect to time of that ER unit vector? Uh, well, beats me. I don't know. I don't know what to do there. Totally lost. No, I'm not. Okay. So we we need to use something called the transport equation. So for derivatives like this, I always I think it's kind of confusing thinking of transport equation. That sounds like something from fluids and how like momentum passes through something, but that's the name it's given. Another name I've seen is the vector differentiation formula, which I kind of like more. Like I don't care about names. Just show me the formula. Okay, here's the formula. Uh, the inertial derivative of this ER unit vector. So derivative with respect to the I frame is the derivative with respect to like its home frame, which is the B frame, the polar frame, plus something else. And this something else is, this is a omega vector. It's an angular velocity cross ER. So this is the transport equation. And for uh, reasons that escape me, the book waits until chapter eight to talk about it, but we're gonna talk about it early because it's good to know, it's helpful. Uh, we're missing a piece here because like, okay, what's this omega? What is the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the uh, I frame? Yeah, let's let's talk about that. I mean, first let me kind of describe what each of these terms are. What is this term? This is the rate of change of the vector ER change with time as seen in the i frame this d by dt er with respect to b it's the same thing rate of change of vector er seen in the b frame and then this last part this is the rate of change of the vector ER due to the rotation of the B frame with respect to WRT, with respect to the I frame. So that's what that last part with the omega is. It's the kind of effective rate of change due to just the fact that one frame is rotating with respect to the other. And I, I don't mean necessarily steady rotation. This isn't steady rotation, you know, constant rotation. Omega might change from moment to moment, but you can calculate what's the instantaneous omega. So that's what we'll, that's what we'll talk about now. We will, we will treat the B frame as a rotating frame. that is rotating instantaneously with an angular velocity uh, omega. An angular velocity vector, which is this I omega thing, I omega B. What does this notation mean? It means means the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the I frame. And here's the form it will have 
especially if we're just talking about like in 2D, this is gonna be, it's gonna be a scalar thing, which is an angular rate. That'll be a scalar times an axis of rotation. which will be a unit vector. So how do we see that here? There is, we've got, going to this diagram in the upper left, there's an implied third direction, which is coming out of the screen at you. And it is, you could either call it N3, it's coming out of the screen, but it also, this is equal to E3. So E3 equals N3. It's coming out screen. It's a third direction. And it needs to obey the right-hand rule. So we need that this third direction, N3, is cross product of the first two. So N1, right-hand rule, N1 cross N2, my thumb is pointing in the N3 direction. ER cross E theta, my thumb is pointing in the E3 direction, the same direction coming out of the screen. So that is the, if you imagine that, that, the, the ER frame moving with respect to the N frame, it's moving on a hinge or an axis of rotation and that axis of rotation is the third direction coming out of the screen. So the axis is, we could either say N3 or E3, they're the same direction, it's just the third direction. Um, so our axis of rotation is E3. What is the angular rate? Well, the angular rate would be is theta dot. Imagine if, if theta dot is a constant, then we've got the polar frame rotating at a constant rate and there's this axis E3. So that is the vector. I omega B is equal to theta dot E3. Okay. It will take some practice to figure out getting what this angular velocity of different frames is, but um, it will come to you. And we'll, we will say more about it next week especially when it gets more intuitive when you think of these frames as being attached to uh, rigid bodies because we have some idea of how rigid bodies turn. All right, let's, so let's go back to this transport equation, right, and write each of the terms. So what is the time derivative of the ER unit vector with respect to the B frame? Well, since the ER is part of what defines the B frame, it doesn't move with respect to the B frame. If I'm you know, on the B frame, there's the B frame, there's our origin, here's ER, C theta. This thing isn't moving, ER not moving with respect to B frame. So this is a, zero, in fact, I'll put a little arrow over it to remind us, this is the zero vector, okay? Now, the other part is this angular velocity thingy, the part that's due to the rate of change of the B frame with respect to the I frame. So I omega B cross, why do I keep getting this wrong? Cross ER, the cross product there. This is equal to theta dot E3 cross ER. Um, the scalar gets pulled out of the cross product and so we're just left with the cross product E3 cross ER. So let me put in the E3 unit vector into this diagram down here and we'll use the right hand rule. So E3 cross ER, uh, my thumb is pointing in the E theta direction.
e theta. So that means this term is theta dot e theta. Uh, okay, good. We've got that. So putting everything together, you're like, this doesn't seem easier than that direct method you were talking about. It, yeah, well, once you get to know it, it is. So this is equal to, let me just rewrite uh, we have up here. We're, we're, we're rewriting this thing, right? This is the inertial derivative. So it's r dot er plus r, and then that weird time derivative of the er direction. So collecting everything, this is r dot er plus r theta dot e theta. So this is, uh, this is good, it's good. And if you're following along with the book, this is equation 3.26. And it is describing the inertial derivative of the particle location. So how the particle is moving with respect to the inertial frame, but we're writing it in terms of polar uh, frame unit vectors, er and e theta, and also polar coordinates, er, I mean, r dot, r, and theta dot, those are all polar coordinates, okay? So there's this distinction between what you're taking, when you have a vector, you take the derivative with respect to a frame, but then the unit vectors in which you describe that and the components in which you describe it can be different. So now that we've got this, right, this is the inertial uh, velocity to do, anything with Newton's laws, we need to get the inertial acceleration. So we need to do this again. We need to write the inertial derivative of the inertial derivative of the position. Or if you want the inertial derivative of the inertial velocity, because this is the inertial acceleration. So let's do it. And I wrote something up here that I said was the transport equation. Um, and this holds not just for the unit vector ER, it holds for any vector. So that's what's pretty amazing about it. Okay, so maybe I'll just say that again. Transport equation holds for any vector, maybe I'll just say a vector A, okay? So, and it relates not just the inertial frame and a polar coordinate frame, it actually relates any two frames, any two frames that are related by a rotation, even an instantaneous rotation. So this is, um, this is true for any vector A. Which means, in particular, it holds if we if we used as a this inertial velocity up here. So, acceleration is let me write inertial derivative with respect to the i frame of this inertial velocity equals d by d. T with respect to the B frame of the inertial velocity plus uh, plus what plus I omega B cross this inertial velocity. And we can just plug in what we have from up above. I'll treat this as the two terms as I'll call this, you know, circle A. And this one I'll call circle B and deal with them separately. So what is circle A? That equals 
derivative with respect to the B frame of R dot ER plus R theta dot E theta. And this equals R double dot ER plus R theta, oh, R dot theta dot plus R theta double dot E theta. And that's just by using the, the product rule for derivatives and the fact that the E unit vectors do not change with respect to the B frame because they are fixed with respect to the B frame. They define the B frame. Um, in fact, I'll, I should probably put my, I'm gonna need this later anyway. So here are the unit vectors. And then we've got E3 coming out of the screen. All right, that is circle A, now circle B, that term. Let's just plug in what we know for omega. The ex, uh, angular acceleration is theta dot E3 cross um, R dot ER plus R theta dot E theta. Okay, this becomes uh, R dot theta dot E3 cross ER plus R theta dot squared E3 cross E theta. Now let's do the right hand rule twice. What's E3 cross ER? It gives me E theta. What is E3? E3 cross E theta, my thumb is pointing in the negative ER direction. So this is negative ER. So this B term here, the part due to just acceleration is R dot theta dot E theta minus R theta dot squared ER. Put them together, collect terms, and the inertial acceleration is r double dot minus r theta dot squared er. Right, I'm collecting all the ER terms and then all the E theta terms. Let's see, theta R, theta double dot, plus, now we end up with a plus two R dot theta dot E theta. And this is uh, equation 3.27 in the book. So we've written the inertial acceleration of the particle. So this two derivatives with respect to time and with respect to the I frame, but written in terms of B frame or polar frame coordinates and vector components. It's perfectly legit. This is, this works. This Thing over here, sometimes we've written it as the inertial acceleration of P with respect to O, okay? And then we've got uh, these different things. We can recognize maybe some more familiar terms like this term, uh, negative R theta dot squared, the ER direction. This is the, centripetal acceleration. And then this thing with its kind of characteristic factor of two, two r dot theta dot e theta. This is the Coriolis acceleration. And it just sort of falls out of this analysis with careful use of the um, 
uh, transport equation. And let me see. Oh, wow. So using using this form of the acceleration, that is uh, in the B frame components. Uh, and coordinates. Uh, it's easier to solve the pendulum equation. Meaning the, the equation of motion for the pendulum. Or at least to write it down. I'll say write the equation of motion for the pendulum. Usually solve means something like solve for how it moves forever as a function of time. Um, and just a last note, because this is, I think this is key. Uh, this is the inertial acceleration. The acceleration with respect to the inertial frame acceleration of the point P with respect to the inertial frame. but we're writing it in terms of the B frame coordinates. What do I mean by that? The coordinates means it's R and theta and their time derivatives. These are scalars and their time derivatives. And B frame uh, unit vectors. That means ER and E theta as instantaneous directions. Okay, so you need to distinguish in, in your mind between, okay, I take the derivative of a vector with respect to a frame, but I can actually write that vector in terms of any components or frame I want. Uh, let me sort of end with showing some videos that might be helpful with relating frames. I don't know if this is the time to show it, but may as well. This is a, this is a marble. I think on the left, what we're seeing is the inertial frame. And so that's a camera that's fixed. This is gonna be a marble kind of moving in a giant bowl. And the right is a camera that's rotating at a certain rate just so that you could see. So they, right, they grab the, the marble, pushing it back and forth. And in the inertial frame, this is kind of what you expect. The marble just kind of moves back and forth in the bowl. But on the right side, due to the fact that we're viewing this from a rotating frame, you get this kind of weird motion and you could view it in terms of uh, centripetal acceleration and all that. I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, ever ask you, you know, find the Coriolis acceleration or something. I, typically, beyond uh, sophomore level dynamics, we don't, we don't care. Um, all right, here's a, here's another visualization. Uh, this is just an animation, but right, you've got a cannon on a rotating disc. Cannon is shooting balls. They go in straight lines in the inertial frame. But if we now switch to this rotating disk's reference frame, and this is a steadily rotating disk. So you see what looks like curved paths for things that are inertially going straight. And now they'll visualize it using Coriolis and centrifugal forces. You can see what's going on there. Um, yeah, you're not typically gonna be asked to you know, identify anything like that.
because our goal is just to write down the equations of motion and then, and then simulate. So for simulation purposes, um, for a given problem, maybe it's better to use polar coordinates and you would write down your differential equations in polar coordinates and then put it into Mathematica or MATLAB or your favorite um, software package. And then you start with some initial condition and then you solve for the motion. Um, so we did some heavy lifting today in terms of kind of defining this, introducing the transport equation, which you'll use quite a bit. 